What's good? It's your boy 2K here. Shout out to the movement and everybody who's moving with us. Yo, it's about that time, man. Guillermo Rigondeau. <laughs> I told y'all, man, I was going to do a two-part series on how this cat quit against a guy many like to call the Matrix. Hell, I even did a fucking promo for it, right? But I figured, well, shit, since they call him the Matrix... Maybe I should do this two-part series in that format. So, I'm going to give y'all a, a blue pill version and a red pill version, right? Of course, the blue pill version is going to consist of everything you saw this past Saturday was how it seemed, right? Whereas the red pill version is going to be kind of an under-the-hood possibility of an actuality, right? What really happened, uh, what we didn't see. Right now, before you motherfuckers come on my goddamn channel talking about, oh, you're making excuses when you hear the red pill version, understand I'm not right. I made a promo about this shit that tells you that I'm not making any excuses. Uh, this is just two different perspectives, you know, of course, what we saw last Saturday, and then what a lot of people seem to think what actually happened, right? The actual reality behind this fight, either way, you spin it. Guillermo Rigondeaux is still at fault because he quit. So this video right here is going to be the blue pill version. Now, Guillermo Rigondeaux went in there last Saturday night, right? He was completely outclassed. He had no answers for the uh, the overwhelming volume that Vasily Machenko brought into the ring, right? He tried to pot shot. He stayed on the defensive, which isn't a surprise. That's his. That's a style, right? But against Vasily Lomachenko, he needed to have a little more volume. He actually needed to do more of the leading, right? To keep Vasily Lomachenko out of his comfort zone. He needed to use feints. He didn't faint not one fucking time in this fight, right? Um, the footwork was, was matched. Uh, whenever Vasily Lomachenko tried to, tried to turn him, Guillermo Rigondeaux was able to turn with him beautifully, too. That's probably the only thing Guillermo Rigondeaux did well in this fight. But... Contrary to what I believe, Vasil Lomachenko was able to adjust very well, right? I said uh, Vasil would have problems adjusting. He didn't, right? Um, he adjusted very well. He changed depth on Guillermo Rigondeaux. Kind of stayed right in front of him. Kept Guillermo Rigondeaux within that triangle, as I mentioned in uh, my prediction video about the triangle theory. And how guys with great footwork like Manny Pacquiao and Vasil Lomachenko and, and many others. Uh, like to keep fighters within that triangle. Henry Armstrong was another one, right? Um, he did that very well with a guy who can actually move around the wing, ring just as good as he can. So he adjusted and figured out, hey, this guy can move just along with me. Let me just smother him with volume and give him subtle angles, not too many of them, and not make it too obvious, just make it subtle while at the same time I'm keeping punches in his face, right? A little bit different from what he, he's normally doing, kind of on the same realm, but the way that he changed depths uh, against Rigo, that's a bit different. He hasn't really done something like that. And it was surprising to see him do that against a fighter of uh, Guillermo Rigondeaux's talents, right? Specifically his defensive talents. So in this scenario, he went out there and got completely outclassed so much so that he said, fuck it, I'm done. I can't take the shit no more. Nigga whooping my ass, you know, he done took my lunch money, motherfucking done took my manhood. Basically, I got in the ring. I said, yo, let's fight. The nigga hit me. I said, wait, hold up, hold up, hold up. <laughs> Stop, man. Time out, time out. <laughs> Vasil Lomachenko basically phone checked the shit out of Guillermo Rigondeaux. Rigo was minding his own business, you know, called his mom back home and said, Mom, I'm doing well out here in America, you know, I'm, you know, I'm just trying to fit in, I'm trying to get my money. Vasil Lomachenko walked up to him and said, phone check, homie, give me that shit. And Rigo gave it to him. He quit. Oh, fuck, I don't want any trouble. <laughs> That's what happened, right? And then quitting, he said he hurt his hand. Now, I put... A picture of his actual hand injury in the beginning of this video that injury is so fucking common in boxing it's not even funny 
if any of my subscribers or listeners happen to see me, right? I happen to meet any of you cats, right? You'll see that if you look at my right hand, because I'm, I'm right-handed, my knuckle, one of my knuckles on my right hand is permanently huge, much bigger than all the other knuckles on my hand and much bigger than the equivalent knuckle on my left hand, right? Much bigger. Because that same injury that Guillermo Rigondeaux had in that fight is the same injury that I had as an amateur and many fucking others have had, right? Many others have had the same type of injury. That hand injury is so common. And so many other fighters have fought with that same hand injury, getting it early in fights and still fucking continuing, right? So that is not an excuse to quit. See... I hate quarters. I can't stand quarters. Being a quitter in whatever you do implies that you're a weak-minded person, right? It implies that you don't have any self-discipline, any self-motivation. Hell, it really implies that you're not too confident in yourself. You're not too confident in your abilities to rebound. In whatever situation that you're in, right? If the going gets too tough, you're like, eh, fuck it, I'll quit. Maybe I'll get another chance to do this, right? It's it's equivalent to hitting a reset button on the motherfucking Nintendo. You know what I'm saying? Like, this fight was equivalent, and this is for all my old heads. You little niggas have no idea what I'm about to say. You know what I'm saying? This fight was equivalent to you and your mans playing Tecmo Bowl and your man's picked the Oakland Raiders. All my old heads know what the fuck I'm talking about. You had Bo Jackson on the Oakland Raiders. The developers of Tecmo Bowl, man, they made Bo Jackson virtually fucking invincible. You couldn't tackle this nigga. He ran through all the tackles. If he got the ball, you did a run play, instant touchdown. <laughs> right? So it was. there was a national rule. I don't know about a, a global rule. I'm going to I'm gonna have to talk to some of my Japanese niggas and shit. To see if, you know, over there this rule applied or, you know, in Germany, Europe and, you know, uh, uh, UK, see if this rule applied when they played this game. But it was a national rule that if you played another cat in Tecmo Bowl, neither one of you could pick the Oakland Raiders or else you automatically get to hit the reset button. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Everybody I know, whether it was the hood, whether it was the suburbs that played Tecmo Bowl, they know about that fucking rule right well this fight was like Vasil Lomachenko picked the Oakland Raiders and Guillermo Rigondeaux picked fucking the Minnesota Vikings at that time who were garbage right you know what I'm saying he had the Vikings and shit trying to go up against Bo Jackson and the Raiders so he pretty much hit the reset button but the only difference here is that that reset button doesn't grant you a second opportunity right because this is called life, nigga. You don't just get second opportunities granted to you. Hell, when motherfuckers get second opportunities granted to them, it's seen as a blessing. You are a guy who's been in this sport that was not blessed. You are a guy that the major entities within this sport don't like and tried to get out of the sport. So... Why the fuck would you think that you had an opportunity to hit the reset button and you'd be granted a second chance? Hell, to support my fucking theory, what was the first one of the first things he said in the post-fight interview? I'll be back. How do you figure, nigga? Because the WBA already stripped you. They said before this fight that if you lose to Vasil Lomachenko at 130 pounds fighting for the WBO title, which is a separate organization from the WBA, right? That the WBA will strip you of your super title at 122. And now, right now, I will quote Virgil Hunter and saying, this is something I've, I've never seen in all my years in boxing, right? Usually when a nigga gets stripped for moving weights, like the WBO will strip you, for example, if you, if you have a version of their title, at one weight 
and you choose to move up or down to challenge for uh, a different weight's version of that title, right? Perfect example, Chris Algieri, when he wanted to fight Manny Pacquiao, he won the WBO title off of Ruslan Provodnikov, right? And then he wanted to challenge Manny Pacquiao at 147 for his WBO title. So before this nigga actually even got in the ring with Manny Pacquiao, the WBO had already stripped him and, and made the title vacant, right? Also, another scenario in which you see titles uh, getting stripped from fighters that move weights, maybe they moved up or down a weight and they won a title in that new division. Well, the title, the, the title or titles that you owned in your home division, they will give you a set time frame in which you have to move back down or up to defend those titles. They'll say, hey, we know you're the champion at 135. You have 90 days to come back down to 130 and um, defend your title against our mandatory. If you choose not to defend your title against that mandatory, you will be stripped. All the, those two those two scenarios are valid. Happens in boxing all the time. What's not valid is a guy who holds a belt in his home division moves up to challenge a guy in a separate division for a separate belt in a different organization and ends up getting stripped by his home division's belt. That's never, I've never seen that before. And neither has Virgil Hunter and many others that have been around boxing for years, decades, right? So you've been you've been put in that scenario before you got in the ring with Lomachenko, dog, right? Also, this is a guy that's been ostracized in boxing, right? He beat the 2012 Fighter of the Year and potential cash cow for Bob Arum, right? At that time, he was still making money off Manny Pacquiao and Juan Manuel Marquez fighting each other 67 times a year. You know what I'm saying? He was still making money off that. But Nonito Donaire was supposed to be the next guy, kind of like Lomachenko is right now, right? He was supposed to be what Lomachenko is today back in 2013. 2013 was Nonito Donaire's year, dog, because he just won fight of the year the year before. So that was his year. He was about to make Bob some good motherfucking money, right? And Bob tried his hardest to not make the Rigo fight. At that time, Rigo was in a stable. He kind of wanted to separate the two. Hey, Rigo, you'll dominate, uh, you know, you'll dominate this division. We'll move uh, Nonito Donera up to 126 because that's what they were talking about previously. We'll move him up to 126. Let him take 126. Rigo, you take 122. That's what was supposed to happen, right? But the two wanted to fight. Nonito Donera kind of felt slighted, just like Canelo felt slighted um, whenever Arislandi Laura called him out. Oscar De La Hoya didn't want to go that route. Canelo said, fuck it, go that route. Same reason why I feel Vasily Lomachenko felt a little slighted because of what uh, Rigo was doing on Twitter, talking all this shit, right? No, Nino Donaire felt the same way. A lot of people thought Donaire was scared of Rigo, okay? Because Rigo was just killing motherfuckers at 122. They thought he was scared. So Donaire wanted to fight. And like I always tell you, cats, man, this is like the fifth time I've said this, and I still see motherfuckers thinking that this that the, the opposite rings true. If a fighter really wants a fight to happen, they will talk to their management team and their promoter, and they will express, hey, I really want this fight to happen. Get it made. His team will oblige. He pays his team to get shit done. Right. Yes, he signs a contract uh, between managers and between promoters. Right. But he still pays those guys to do their job. Right. They just they just fighters just allowed their management team to take over the business side. So it, it seems as if the the fighter is like at their mercy, but that's not actually the case. You know what I mean? If they really want something to happen, they have to oblige. And that's what happened there. No needle De Niro wanted that fight to happen. They obliged it. Get him a rigging down, beat the shit out of him. Basically took a lot of money out of Bob Barham's pockets. Um, and Bob Barham immediately voiced his opinion after that fight. Basically saying, hey, I can't market this guy. Which doesn't make much sense when that fight was an exciting fight. 
a lot of people actually uh, thought Re uh, Guillermo Rigondeaux was a very good fighter after that fight. Nobody said the fight was boring, at least not in my opinion. I don't remember anybody saying that shit. Again, I wasn't on social media like that at that time. But I didn't hear a lot of cats talking about it like that. Uh, around 2013, 2014, boxing pundits were upset that Rigo was ostracized after that fight, right? People wanted to see more Rigo. So HBO put him in a fight with Joseph Agbeko, and then they completely dogged him for the entire 12 rounds, right? While hundreds of thousands of casuals were listening. So what happened? They all take what HBO commentators say as the gospel, and they said, oh, we fucking hate this guy, right? Then you got uh, media brown noses and shit, you know, boot licking, dick sucking ass media people that don't know shit about boxing, but are just in it because they like to be around the celebrities or the so-called celebrities, right? Within the sport, you know, your Doug Fishers, you know, motherfuckers that don't know shit about boxing, your Steve Kims, right? Dan Raphael's been around the boxing, the sport of boxing for a long time, but can't break down the fight to save their motherfucking lives. And y'all cats be listening to these niggas, man. These guys have agendas. They they have allegiance to some of these major entities that are within the sport, whether it's a network or a promoter. They have an allegiance to these guys. So they're going to give you a bunch of biased ass shit. And that's what happened. They got to the right. They started talking. Oh, Guillermo Rigondeaux is boring. Oh, he's a shit fighter. Fuck him. And the majority of boxing fans say, yep, fuck him. <laughs> so when you've been put in that scenario, Rigo, and they tell you, hey, we stripping you, dog, on some shit that nobody's ever heard of before, right? Given... What I just talked about, how you've been ostracized. And of course, I didn't go into detail, but that's when, that's when it started. The fight where you should have been making millions of dollars for every fight after that. That was your breakout fight. They completely threw you under the rug and pretty much took you off the networks. They put you in that situation, dog. How the fuck can you sit there and think that you have the opportunity to hit the reset button? Now he's in there in the media talking about him and uh, Pedro Diaz talking about, oh, yeah, we coming back. We're going to 122. Bruh, nobody's going to want to fight you now, dog. They didn't want to fight you before. And a lot of the reasons for why they didn't want to fight you were, was because you're a boring fighter. And you just upheld the opinions of these motherfuckers that ducked you, man. You just upheld their opinion. You just basically told everybody, yo, they were right. <laughs> this shit makes no fucking sense, man. So, in the scenario where everything you saw last Saturday is exactly the way it played out, get him a rigging out, bit off way more than he could chew, right? And I hear a lot of motherfuckers talking about, hey, no, he, you know, he, 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 he was overwhelmed and, you know, he just, he just had to quit. See, this is the thing, man. As a next fighter, and I, as I told you before, I still train, you know what I'm saying? Just in case I got fucking nigga up, you know? But as an ex fighter who competed, one of the first things a trainer, and these are all trainers, these aren't just the bad ones or the very good ones, right? The first thing a trainer will tell you, one of the first things that they try to uh, make instinctive, right? Is the value of not quitting. It's one of the first things they do when you walk into a gym, right? They will let you know, hey, this sport is grueling and it can be fatal. And I'm gonna put your ass through the ringer. You're gonna be doing a whole lot of shit that you ain't never done before, right? But if you listen to what I tell you, if you oblige, right? If you don't question, many, many trainers don't even like you cursing in their gym, right? 
I had a trainer like that. If you just do exactly what they tell you and stay disciplined, stay focused, it won't matter how hard the grind is, you'll get through it, right? That's one of the first fucking things they tell you when you walk in the gym. So with that being a core value as a fighter, quitting is highly unacceptable. Now I understand things can happen, right? You can uh, get a, an, incur an injury in a bout and maybe it's too much of an injury to keep going. You know what I'm saying? Like David Hayes injury, where he, he tore his Achilles tendon, but he kept going. Why? Because he stuck to his core value. You see what I'm saying? I can't stand David Hay, but I commend the fuck out of him for continuing with a torn Achilles tendon. This nigga hobbling all over the ring, B. Hobbling. But he stuck to his core value and said, I can't quit. This has not been ingrained in me. As a fighter, I must stick to my core values instilled in me since the first day I walked in the gym, and that is do not quit. Always go out on your shield and always try to finish the fight because the trainer will tell you, I will look out for you. I will let the referee know when you have had enough. Trainer tells you that, right? That's why the trainer has the ability to throw in the towel. So they don't want you quitting. They're watching the fight and they're like, yeah, let me, let me get them out of here. They will do that. If you have a good trainer, your trainer will look out for you, right? So, and this is a message to a lot of motherfuckers out there that don't understand. You know, I, there's niggas out there really condoning the fact that Guillermo Rigondeaux quit off of a common injury. Let me just go into a, a few examples, you know what I'm saying, where fighters have incurred major fucking injuries and continued to fight. Tommy Morrison. TKO a fighter by the name of Joe Hip in 1992 after suffering a broken hand and a broken jaw. Continued to fight one by knockout. Bernard Hopkins, when he was just the IBF middleweight title, he hadn't become undisputed yet, right? He was defending his IBF title in 2000 against a fighter by the name of Antoine Eccles. Y'all remember him, right? Well, midway into the fight, he dislocated his shoulder. Continued to fight one by unanimous decision. That shit right there by Menard was like, oh, nigga, fuck that shit, dog. I'm not losing my title off that. I'm going to continue to fight. You see what I'm saying? I'm going to keep fighting. He had to drive because he didn't want to lose his title, right? Donovan Razor Ruddick, known for his two fights with Mike Tyson uh, after Mike Tyson got out of prison, right? I think it was after or before. You two, go ahead and correct me if I'm wrong. I can't remember. I'm not looking at anything right now, but... Fight was in the uh, mid-90s. I think it was after he got out. Anyway, fight was in the mid-90s, right? In one of his bouts with Mike Tyson, he suffered a broken jaw while Mike Tyson had a perforated eardrum. They continued to fight, right? Muhammad Ali fought Ken Norton with a broken jaw. And he fought Jerry Corey with broken ribs. <laughs> Continued to fight in both those fights, right? Arturo Gotti broke his hand in one of the fights against Mickey Ward. Continued to fight, right? One of my favorites, Arthur Abraham, suffered a broken jaw in the fourth round against hard-hitting, undefeated Edison Miranda, right? I mean, his jaw was literally fucking hanging, dog. And all this blood was gushing out of his mouth. You know what I'm saying? It looked like the nigga like bit his tongue off of some shit. And he kept his mouth open for the remainder, the remaining eight rounds of the fight. Every punch he threw, you could go back and watch the fight. He threw a punch. He had his mouth wide the fuck open. Every time he got hit on the jaw, it was like, oh shit, they hit him. That nigga hit him there again. <laughs> right? And remember, Edison Miranda at that time was seen as the Julian Jackson of the middleweight division. He was knocking motherfuckers smooth, clean, out with one shot, right? He had major power and he was undefeated so he had major confidence. Not only did Arthur Abraham continue to fight with his jaw literally fucking hanging by a thread, but he won. 
<laughs> he won by unanimous decision and it wasn't a bad decision. Could have gone either way, but it really wasn't that bad of a decision, right? And one of my favorites, a fighter in the 60s who campaigned at welterweight by the name of Gypsy Joe Harris. A lot of you cats might not know who this is, right? He fought his entire pro career blind and one fucking eye. Come on, people. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Are you kidding me? You got a motherfucker who's been blind in one eye his entire life, right? And was able to keep this as a secret going through the amateurs and turning professional, right? Fighting very well. Uh, beating a lot of guys well enough to the point where he gets on the cover of Sports Illustrated very well enough to the point where they compare him to the welterweight version of Muhammad Ali. He was that good. And he only suffered one loss to a Hall of Fame fighter by the name of Emil Griffith. If you know boxing, you know Emil Griffith, one of the best fighters in boxing history. Lost to him by, by a 12-round decision. Right, I think it went 15 rounds, I'm not sure. But he went the distance, right? That's the only loss on his record. They had to force him out of boxing because for uh, one of his, it was, I can't remember, it was, uh, I can't remember who he was fighting, but the fight that was gonna be his last fight anyway, right? Um, he had to do an eye exam and he failed the eye exam and they figured out, hey, this motherfucker is legally blind in, in one of his eyes, right? And for years, he tried to get his boxing license back, but they just couldn't do it. I mean, being legally blind in one eye, that is a major uh, discrepancy or a major flaw uh, that a fighter can have. And, and, you know, even if you're in the ring and one of your eyes is shut, you it might not even be bleeding, no blood anywhere. If they feel you can't see out of one eye, right, they'll stop the fight. The doctors will stop the fight on you. So imagine this motherfucker's blind all the time. They're definitely not going to give you a license, right? So we're going to condone a motherfucker that had the kind of injury that I actually mentioned a few of these guys in my examples had as well, and they continue to fight. We're going to say it's okay for him to quit with that injury, but you got a nigga that fought with one eye and with one eye legally fucking blind his entire career and fought at the elite level. Get the fuck out of here. Are you kidding me? Stay tuned for part two.